Hello, everyone. This is Glenn Hodges. Welcome to Chattanooga Self Improvement Meetup, a mastermind group where we listen, learn, ask questions, and comment in an effort to help make each other the best version of ourselves, thus helping to make the world a better place in which to live. I want to start today's program with a, a short story that I ran across uh, recently. It doesn't necessarily have to do anything with our guest speaker's talk today, but we're all about self-improvement, and oftentimes uh, circumstances will change the way we perceive things, the way we will see things. There was a blind girl who hated herself just because she was blind. She hated everyone except her loving boyfriend. He was always there for her. She said that if she could only see the world, she would marry her boyfriend. One day, someone donated a pair of eyes to her, and then she could see everything, including her boyfriend. Her boyfriend asked her, Now that you can see the world, will you marry me? The girl was shocked when she saw that her boyfriend was blind too and refused to marry him. Her boyfriend walked away in tears and later wrote a letter to her saying, Just take care of my eyes, dear. Well, what's the message there? I'll let you be thinking about that. In the meantime, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, my friend, Dr. Greg Corradino. He is a neurosurgeon who, after realizing he was ill-prepared to start and manage his own practice, also sought out an MBA degree. Practicing in Kingsport, Tennessee since 1992, Dr. Corradino enjoys painting, traveling, and spending time with his wife and four children. And we're very pleased to have one of his children, his oldest son, Greg, with us, who is one of the founding members of our group, who is currently living in Brazil. Without further ado, it's all yours, Dr. Corradino. Well, thank you, Glenn. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the group. As uh, Glenn has mentioned, I uh, was originally born in New York. I did my medical school and college training in uh, Virginia <clears throat> and uh, moved down to Tennessee after I finished my residency training. And I've been in Tennessee for almost 30 years now. And I've enjoyed it and I've built my practice here. And I wanted to share my experience with uh, other physicians that were um, beginning to uh, their practices. And that's really the reason why I uh, wrote the book. So there's a lot of uh, applicability in this book to uh, entrepreneurs in particular, people that are trying to build up their own brand and um, the, le the main lessons from the book are what, what I wanted to speak about today because uh, the, the book is really not any medically focused in the sense that there's not really medical terms or anything like that in the book, but it's really as a is really designed as a primer, a primer for uh, physicians who really have very little or no business training. And I think these are common to a lot of entrepreneurs. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned over the years, uh, both from my experience, good and bad, and uh, a lot of the experience that I've had uh, in my MBA training. And then uh, beyond that, uh, a lot of seminars that I've attended in terms of learning about business ideas and business principles. So that is the genesis for this. So I'd like to share with you a uh, presentation that I did to uh, <clears throat> just uh, uh, emphasize these principles. And so it's a, it'll be a slideshow and I hope that it's not uh, too difficult to see it. So here we go. Now, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to stop me along the way. I'll be happy to uh, discuss with them. 
anything that uh, comes up during or after the, uh, the talk here. And I'll go through these slides pretty quickly so I, I won't be uh, boring you too much. I hope you've had your coffee. So we're gonna talk about how to succeed in business without really trying. Not really, this was a book that was written in the 1950s and it was kind of a little joke kind of book. But we are gonna talk about the keys that I have for success that I think are really important for physicians in particular, but I think they apply to any, anybody's business and also life outside of business. So, you know, as we know, small businesses have a very high rate of uh, failure, 21% uh, in the first year. Only half of them are still around at five years and only a third make it for 10 years. And why? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Um, and you'll see some of them here, you know, market. Leadership issues, I think that's a big one. Uh, for fail failure to fill needs, competition. Uh, there's a there's a uh, restaurant here in town that uh, it seems to change hands about every two or three years. Uh, they put up a pizza place there. It's a hamburger place. It's a uh, Mustang Sally uh, dance hall. It's all kinds of stuff. And every couple of years, this business just fails and has to restart. I don't know why, but there's definitely an issue there. I think in this case, it's uh, more of location and the failure to adapt to uh, changes. I mean, we've all seen this in the past year. There's so many issues that have come about due to the financial impacts of the pandemic that a lot of businesses have failed. Uh, they've had to deal with the government uh, regulations coming in that affect it and um, they just can't adapt, but many have adapted. And uh, you see things like uh, delivery or taking out uh, uh, food to the uh, person's car for Pizza Hut and places like that. And these places have adapted pretty well and, and probably are going to do better once the uh, restrictions are lifted. Remember the movie, those of us that are old enough remember the movie, if you build it, they will come. And uh, the question I have is if you build it, will they come and how will you get them to come and will you get them to stay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about what I think the keys are to success for any kind of uh, business and in particular medical practice. But I really think it's important that you have a uh, value system that you uh, adhere to both personally and within your business, uh, your mission as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about planning and act, taking action, communication and leadership. Uh, one of the things I, I uh, tend to talk about is I think when you see a business that's treating its customers poorly that you can pretty much always trace that back to a poor leadership or or training, the associates are the kind of people that you hang around with and uh, the, you have to spend some time actually trying to build your business as well. So those are the keys that we're gonna talk about today. So I, I start with the values because I think it's really important to think about what you value in terms of your own business and your own life in general and how you can relate that to how you treat your customers and your staff. So these are your highest priorities and the standards that you set. And I think it starts with yourself, what kind of standards you, start, you set for yourself, how you conduct yourself. Do you show up on time? Do you show up well-groomed? Are you ready to go when you show up? Do you take care of yourself so that you are ready to go? So here, Here's my thoughts about uh, my practice values and how I want to conduct myself in my uh, own little world here. So in integrity is very important uh, and being consistent. Uh, trust, I need to have, I need to earn the trust of my uh, staff and my patients every day. Uh, I want everybody, including myself, to uh, exhibit caring attitude towards people. I think it's very important to communicate both with 
ourselves internally and with our staff and with and the staff with the our clients or patients. And I want to create a positive work environment for my group. So that's important to me. Now your mission statement, we've all heard about mission statements. I'm not going to spend a lot of time harping on it, but it's your reason for being uh, the product that you serve, who you, who you serve it for, how you deliver it. And I just have a couple here that for examples, uh, McDonald's wants to be the, the uh, customer's I'm losing my, uh, I can't even see what <laughs> my screen here. Here we go. It wants to be our customer's favorite place to and way to eat. So that's important for McDonald's. Walmart, on the other hand, wants to save people money so they can live better. <clears throat> now, when you go to McDonald's, you're not going to go there. I mean, when you go to Walmart, you're not going to go there and expect the kind of service that you would get if you went to Neiman Marcus or another upscale place, but you're gonna save money when you go there. That's the reason why you go there. And my mission statement is to deliver the highest quality neurosurgical care to my patients so that they can recover as quickly and effectively as possible. So I think it's important to keep those things in mind when you are developing your mission statement. Uh, what do you wanna do and who are you doing it for? So just a quick reminder, what do you do? How do you do it? What do you do it for? And I think it's very important to have everybody that's on your team uh, on the same page as you are because the frontline worker is going to be the face of your business. So I can pretty much guarantee you that when you are going through your drive through at McDonald's, that the person behind the counter there is likely not really interested in making the experience uh, your favorite place. But I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, especially when you're running a small business, uh, you're gonna be a lot closer to the customer. And I think it is important to have everybody that's on your team and your staff understand what your mission is so that you don't, so that they can make decisions that will um, impact your uh, patients or clients in the way that you want them to. So with that in mind, uh, you know, what are your goals? Where are you going? And uh, you have to plan properly. I think one of the reasons why businesses fail is that they, they don't really plan uh, for contingencies. They don't have a plan and an action plan that they that they uh, follow through with on a daily or weekly basis. So what are your ultimate goals? Here these climbers are trying to get to the top of this uh, very jagged peak here. They knew what to expect, they were prepared for it, and they're very likely to reach it. But what are your goals on a professional basis in your business? Uh, financially, what are your goals? And your personal uh, goals and in your relationships? So your personal goals might be your health or your um, the experiences that you want to have and the relationships with your your family, your friends, your neighbors. Um, you know, what are your goals for that? I think the more that you can think about these things in advance, the more likely you are to succeed at reaching them. And then uh, having a plan. So you need to make an assessment of where you are and. Personally, I do this on a at least a semi-annual basis to where I am uh, professionally uh, in my business, uh, financially, uh, my personal finances, and uh, where do I want to go in the next few months? So you start out with, uh, you know, what do you have? What, where, where are your assets? Are, your, are you well-trained to do the things that you want to do? Are there financial assets that you have? Do you have a team that's working for you? What are the challenges? The challenges might be external challenges like another business that's competing with you, or they might be just the environment. Uh, for, for now, the uh, pandemic is creating a gigantic challenge for everybody. Uh, and then you just have to set your priorities and start to develop a schedule and then just act on it. So outside of medicine, uh, I think a lot of doctors just get up and they come to work and 
They just work day to day and day to day. And I think we've all heard that you need to spend time on your business, not work, not just working in your business. And uh, personally, I think about a month, every, uh, one, one day a month or a half a day a month is important to kind of sit back and say, where am I? Am I getting to where I want to go? So uh, am, uh, have I acted on all the things that I wanted to act on? Have, have new challenges come up over the past few weeks that I wasn't anticipating? Uh, the next uh, aspect of success in business and I think in life is communication. And uh, as this little drawing shows here, it's a two-way street. Uh, just because you're speaking into one end of the microphone there doesn't mean that there's anybody at the other end and doesn't mean that the other end, the person at the other end is understanding or, you know, getting your message. So I think you have to start out with your own self-communication. I think it's a big, big thing to do. Uh, how do you wake up every day? What kind of attitude do you have towards the challenges that you're going to face during the next uh, 12 or 16 hours that you're awake? And how do you communicate with others, both on a personal and a professional basis? Um, I think it's, if you look at the principles outlined by Dale Carnegie a uh, hundred years ago or so, uh, you have to start out, you have to be empathetic towards their um, situation or staff uh, place in life. Uh, it's really important to develop negotiation skills because everything in life that we uh, desire or need is, is either owned or controlled by other people. And we have to figure out a way to uh, give them what they need so that we can get what we need to live the kind of life that we want. And in a small business or as an entrepreneur, uh, leadership is really critically important uh, because you're gonna be very close to your team and you're going to be communicating with your staff and your customers or clients. You're gonna network with other people at the same level that you are, and you're gonna to have to negotiate. So developing think about as well. And uh, you may wanna uh, increase your sphere of influence by teaching others, teaching them what, they do, uh, what you do, uh, helping them move along in life as as you get a little further in your career, uh, being a mentor towards uh, younger folks, uh, as I, I think Glenn is doing a great job with that. And then, uh, you know, working with your community, whether you're joining a community groups such as uh, the um, some of the business groups in the area or this group in particular. So my keys to leadership are to know your own value, uh, as, as I said before, uh, communicate that with and communicate your vision to others. Uh, really be open to learning for your whole, entire life because things are changing very quickly. And if you want to operate the way that you did uh, when you were first uh, starting out, uh, it may not work 10 or 15 years from now. You're all going to be role models for uh, people that are under us, for our family, for our children, and uh, anybody that surrounds us. And I think if you proactively say to yourself, I'm going to be a positive role model, uh, it's a good thing. So whether or not you want to be a role model, you're going to be a role model. Um, I've known physicians who are uh, just not really good people. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's almost embarrassing to be associated with some of these folks because they show up late and they have bad attitudes and they don't realize that they're uh, models for the profession and people around them look to them for leadership because of their um, advanced training and um, knowledge that they have. So uh, when you, um, I think when you proactively think to yourself, I'm going to be a positive role model, you're much more likely to have a a much better influence on, on folks in a positive way than if you just sort of uh, go into it and just fly by the seat of your pants, so to speak. And you want to connect with others. Uh, you need to relate to others and be empathetic, as I said before. 
when you are uh, speaking to others, uh, focus on them. Uh, you know, I, I always say God gave us two ears and only one mouth, so you should be listening a lot more than you're talking. And be concise. I, we all know people that we get on the phone with them and they go on and on and on and on and on and you just get to the point of saying, what's your point? I need to move on here. So communication is important to um, be very clear on what the uh, focus is for your communication and, and just be very concise with it. Uh, I... Um, I play a team sport, ice hockey, and uh, we had a player that just would make some stupid mistakes, and the coach would just yell at this guy constantly in front of the whole group, and uh, it, it was embarrassing to me because I had to listen to it. So the principle of criticizing in in private is just so important for people. And it's, uh, I've really taken it to heart. So whenever I see somebody that's acting in a way that I don't agree with or don't like, I force myself to take a deep breath and um, say under my breath, I need to talk to you about this later, as opposed to uh, undressing them at the time. I remember that when I was a in training, I was uh, in a surgery uh, in my residency and um, I made a mistake during the operation. And the, uh, the chief surgeon uh, turned to the medical students and that were in the room and he said, did, did you see the stupid mistake that Greg just made? And it was one of the most embarrassing experience that I've ever had, but it did teach me the, the uh, critical importance of criticizing people in private uh, because uh, it just didn't really help that uh, he made that comment while I was doing the operation. Uh, it was very demeaning to me. Now, if he'd said, Greg, I need to talk to you about this later and not really made a big deal of it to the other people, that would have been much better for everybody concerned. So it's a very important principle if you're trying to help people improve. And I think it's important to be thankful for all we have and where we are in life. The next thing I want to talk about is working with winners. And, you know, in, in businesses and in life, uh, it's not just working with winners, it's, it's associating with winners. And the less time that you spend with um, people that are negative, people that are, seem to be going in the wrong direction in life, uh, I think the better off you are. Uh, as, a, as a person who maybe has some um, control over who you hire and who you work with, I think it's important to uh, think about who you associate with and, and how you hire people. Because people have more influence over your own uh, trajectory in life than you think that they might. So this is a personal thing and it's also a professional thing. And we can think about it with your staff, the team that you work with, the kind of people that you hang around with uh, both personally and professionally, and also your mentors. So uh, as we all know, Jim Rohn said, uh, you know, you're the average of the five people that you hang around with the most. And you know, look around at those five people and are, are they the kind of people that are positive influences in your life or are they negative? If they're not, uh, maybe you need to think about how you can change that relationship that you have with them or in certain instances, get out of that relationship. Um, when I first came to this town, I was in practice with another physician. And after a year or two, uh, I realized that this guy had um, a viewpoint of life and people and staff and patients that was completely different than mine. And I realized that I was not going to change that situation. And 
it was impossible as a as a partner with him to get away from him until I finally broke away, and uh, I was immediately happier than I had been before because I wasn't being negatively influenced by this guy on a daily basis. And this is, I think, critically important to our own, you know, self worth and how we look at things. So look at the group around you and say, are these the kind of people that I really want to be, you know, uh, going on an upward trajectory with? Or are they they dragging me down? Because if they're not, then I need to rethink my relationship with them. Oops, I don't know how that happened. See if I can get rid of this thing. Give me one second here. Okay. All right. So, um, as I say, you want to work with winners. You want to hire for ability and trainability and attitude. You want people to have congruent values to what yours are. So that's why it's important to know what your values are. People show up for their interview late and unkempt and they, uh, don't speak clearly and concisely, then you may not want to hire this person. So, but you, you have to really, you have to know what your values are so that you can figure out whether or not they're congruent with yours. It's uh, in a lot of uh, ways and uh, having a mentor is important to us to uh, help us along the way. I, I think we all gain from other people's experience. And um, when I was a resident, uh, my one of my uh, trainers, uh, one of my chief residents, said to me, "You know what experience is?" And I said, "No." He says, "Well, experience is what I've screwed up before. So you can let somebody else screw up and learn from that, or you can do it yourself, which is usually more expensive and time-consuming." And I was, I'm, you know, not happy to say that I've learned a lot of things the hard way, uh, but having a mentor to help you stay out of trouble is uh, really important. So the next thing is uh, your advisors. And I think in, if you're in a small business, you need to realize that you can't do everything yourself and you may need legal advice or account, uh, accounting or insurance or investments and banking. And uh, this is important for physicians, uh, especially when um, you know, there's a lot of money floating around through medical practices. And uh, it's very common for um, uh, employees to pilfer money from you, uh, advisors to uh, steer you in the wrong direction. So you have to you know, do your research and find people that you can trust that are accountable for what they're telling you and, and doing with you. And then finally, I think the main thing uh, as far as uh, successful business is uh, how are you going to build your business and, and something to think about on a fairly regular basis. So how do people know you how, or the, how do they know about you? And uh, are you likable or can they trust you? Uh, I don't know if you can see that uh, last thing at the bottom there, but it says people want to do business with people that they know, like, and trust. Uh, sure many of us have heard that advice before. So take a deep breath and say to yourself, am I really likable? Uh, because they, it may not be that you want to be people's best friend, but you have to be a little bit friendly uh, or else people aren't going to want to come back to you. Now, there's a restaurant in town here that uh, it's, it's a fairly upscale restaurant. And when you go in there, uh, the manager is usually around. Uh, he greets you nicely. Uh, there's a, in my case, there's a, two or three waitresses that, uh, you know, that we uh, use most of the time. And it's really nice to have somebody smile at you and say, oh, nice to see you again. And um, it makes you want to go back there. It may be a little more expensive than other places, but... I think uh, getting treated nicely is really uh, something that brings people back in the door. The next thing I want to talk about as far as building a practice or a business is identifying who your ideal customer is. And uh, that's how you create, that's where you create your customer avatar. I don't know how much experience 
your group has had with this, but uh, it was a totally new concept for me when I learned about this a few years ago uh, in my uh, MBA training. So I think knowing who your ideal uh, customer is, in my case, my ideal kind of patient, helps me focus my attention when I'm trying to think about how I'm going to market to people. So how do you create this avatar? Well, there's, there's two parts to it. One is the demographics, their name, their age, uh, what kind of uh, family environment they have, what their occupation might be, what their interests might be. The next thing is their psychographics. And this is what their goals are in life and what their pain points are and what they like and dislike. So for me, uh, as a neurosurgeon, I deal with a lot of patients that have spinal uh, problems. And many of these patients are blue collar workers that are um, in the coal industry or in heavy uh, construction or uh, truck drivers. And they're usually people that are in their uh, 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond. Um, it's easy to figure out what their pain points are. Their back hurts for me. That's, that's an easy point, but um, let's say you're a restaurateur and uh, what's their pain point? Well, they're hungry and uh, they may be coming to the restaurant for immediate food. You know, you're in a fast food environment, so your goal needs to be getting them food quickly or they may be coming there for an experience. And of course, those experiences are much um, dampened right now because of the COVID thing. But eventually people will come back to restaurants and they'll want to have a decent experience. And if you in your mind uh, uh, know what kind of experience you want to give them and you communicate to your staff the same thing and they deliver it, then you're much more likely to have people coming back. So this helps you with a lot of aspects of your business um, because it helps you focus on uh, who you're developing your uh, advertisements or marketing for. And it also helps you deliver the kind of product that you want to deliver to them. So uh, you want to build it around your uh, ideal patient or client. I think it's important, at least in a professional sense, to establish a community presence. In my case, uh, I, for many years, wrote a little article uh, that was in the newspaper, and it was just very simple explanations or discussions about uh, fairly common problems that we deal with, back pain, carpal tunnel syndrome, neck pain, arm pain, and I would give simple answers to these types of questions. And I didn't really think much of it. I would spend about uh, a couple of hours doing this about every month or two, and they would be published in the newspaper for about 100 words uh, answer to a question. And I was really amazed at how many patients would come in and say, oh, I read your article in the paper and um, I was really impressed with it. And so having uh, establishing trust in, in the community, I think is something that can really uh, enhance your uh, business as well. If you do collect testimonials from uh, happy uh, clients or patients, uh, you need to um, use those in a way that uh, helps you. So uh, just having people come in and say, oh, I went to Dr. So-and-so and he helped me, doesn't really do it. But if I, if I say, uh, I went to Dr. So-and-so with X problem and I didn't know what to do and he pointed me in the right direction and got me fixed up uh, very quickly and got me back to my normal activities, that's a lot more effective, especially if you put a name to it. So uh, marketing, uh, I think the people in your group that are have marketing experience understand the difference between branding and creating trust for people, uh, becoming a, a recognized authority in your field. Uh, you can do that by giving presentations to local groups. You can write for a local paper, as I just said. You can write a short Problem Focus book, I, as one of your um, members so talked about doing the ebook, which I think is a great idea. And if it makes sense to you to, to use social media in your marketing, uh, but you got to keep it up to date because if you look at a 
an ad that was created uh, 16 months ago and it hasn't changed or updated at all, it really doesn't enhance your uh, standing in the community very well. So again, uh, all these things are important if you make it an active part. And I th the way I think about it is, what can I do better for my patients this month or this year that I couldn't do last year? Can I deliver something that's better or less costly or faster or a higher quality? Or can I deliver it in a friendlier, uh, a friendlier uh, manner? Uh, a few uh, months ago, I came across a uh, post on Facebook from uh, a nurse and she said, I, I've had it with Dr. So-and-so's office. Uh, the staff there is very unfriendly and I need to go to a new doctor for my, whatever the problem was, dermatologic problem or whatever. And within uh, probably an hour or two, she had, I don't know, 20 people saying, go here, go here, go here. So that doctor you know, had lost a patient that uh, maybe they didn't even realize why, but that patient was gone. So you can deliver the same product, but you can do it in a friendlier manner and that can keep people coming back to you. If you can do that, uh, let them know. You know, my service is a, more, a much higher quality than somebody else's, or I can deliver it much quicker. So here's just a few final thoughts that I have. Success in life and everything doesn't just happen. You have to work for it. I think it's important to know yourself. Uh, that's where your values and your mission comes in. Have a team that's working in the right direction for you. Have a plan for yourself and for everybody around you to get there. Your ability to communicate with yourself, with your staff, with your clients is really something that you need to focus on and work on. You wanna set a good example. You wanna build your team around you. So just my final thoughts here from Colin Powell. There are no secrets to success. It's the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. And that's about all I have, Glenn. Thank you, Dr. Car Cardino. What a, what a lesson in life there and, and building a business. And uh, I, I see that one of the things that kind of filtered through everything you were saying, which kind of was congruent with something that I was teaching to some of Sheikh's group last Saturday uh, or the Saturday before last, uh, the importance of knowing your core values. And with that in mind, I thought that maybe uh, Coach Dan Hall might have a thought to say there in that uh, he always talks about the importance of values and how it, it influences everything we do. Dan? Yes, sir. I think that's very important, not only to know and define our core values for ourselves and maybe our office staff, but also to take it one step further and let our customers know. Do our customers know what we stand for? Because if they don't, how can they resonate with us? If, they're cu if our customers don't understand what our values are, they're left in the dark. They need to know, like, and trust us. And part of that is our core values and communicating that effectively to our customers. So how do we do that? Is that on our website? Is that on, uh, for example, is that on the back of our business cards? I mean, within reach, core values right there. Do you send it out to them in their invoice, a postcard? And by the way, ask for a referral. Did they have a good, good experience? Um, and taking it beyond that, how do we... How do we teach that to our employees rather than go after our employees or our help and say, well, you messed this up and you got to fix it. Do you teach in terms of your core values? Do you discipline in terms of your core values? Do you speak in terms of your core values? Because all of these things play into the business. And if you can create a culture that's centered around your core values, I believe that helps to give your business the edge over a lot of other businesses. Because as we look out there, when we walk into a coffee shop, even if you saw their core values on the wall of, let's say, you know, best taste, better service, 
um, you know, comfort. Wow. Okay. This place is kind of cool. Um, so are we communicating those core values to our customers, to our employees, to the rest of our team? And how are we doing it? Are we doing it effectively? Because I think that actually takes core values to the next level. And it gives a lot of businesses that pay attention to it, the edge over their competition, for sure. Thank you there, Dan. You know, one of the things that you were touching on there, Dr. Cardino, ties right in with something that Anton Demenchuk talks about so often with the Chattanooga Marketing Clinic, the customer life cycle. So Anton, uh, you joined us a little bit late, but want to jump in and, and maybe give us your comments on some of what Dr. Cardino shared and how it ties in with what you teach. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, th I thought it was a pretty useful uh, presentation and, and uh, definitely centering around uh, your patient, your client, your user, your uh, consumer, if you would kind of put it in general. I think that's, that's really the only way to go. And, and I like what you, you were saying, um, where you would put a, in, you know, an article in, in a newspaper and you wouldn't say bye, 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 or come to me, come to me, come to me, or uh, look at me, look at me, look at me. It would be all about back pain, right? And it would be all about something that is really, really relevant to the, to the patient, to the consumer. And all of a sudden, you are the voice of an expert. All of a sudden, you're the friendly voice in the community who is there to kind of support people around you. Um, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, people have back pain and they're, they are coming to you. There's, there's really no magic. Um, and I think in today's world where, again, um, we're all online and we're all a bit more authentic because we're showing our houses, right? We're kind of letting people into our more of a, our personal lives. Um, I think it's inevitable. I think it's really maybe, um, and maybe I'm, I'm missing something, but maybe there are other ways to do it. But I think that it's the only way how a small business or, or, or somebody like, you know, a chiropractor, uh, a dentist, consultant, you know, uh, product-based business really can market today. Uh, it's all about giving value, create, creating that content that's you, you, you versus me, me, me. Um, and uh, really, a, and eventually solving a specific problem that uh, I, I, I like to say that this way, when we, when we add value, we get attention, right? Um, if somebody, just a stranger on the street gives you a, 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 a bill, uh, you know, and it's, you know, it's of a value to you. It's, it's a dollar sign attached to it. So it gets your attention versus a, something that makes no value to you. Um, and then when they solve a specific problem, that's when you get paid. So get attention um, and solve a specific problem for people. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm very much, very much on the same page with you. Definitely. Anton, were you, were you, did you join, uh, while I, before I told the story about the blind girl? No, I, I joined after that. After that. Oh, well, yeah. basically the, the story was about a blind girl that had told her best friend, uh, a young boy that she appeared to be in love with that, you know, if she could only see the world, she would marry him and wouldn't marry him because she couldn't. And so, an, an, an anonymous donor donated two eyes. She had surgery and in a few weeks she was able to see the world. And, mm. uh, he said, will you marry me now? And she discovered that he was also blind and said, no. And he left very disappointed, but then wrote a note. I hope you enjoy seeing the world through my eyes. So does, does that have any meaning? And how does this tie in with what we're talking about? Well, if it's a question to me, I think, yeah, that's, uh, that's really, um, goes against our nature, that story. We're not, that's not in human nature to do a sacrifice for others. I mean, I don't know if we're on the same page here, but I think the greatest evil in this world come from being self-centered. And make no mistake, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is being self-centered. So the synonym to love is to give, right? And so what what uh, what we just heard, you know, is to 
go give, you know, go write an article in the newspaper. Uh, when somebody comes to you, be friendly. I mean, give, give, give. Um, and, and it really go, goes against human nature. Uh, we kind of have to train ourselves to be that way. And, and giving the eyes to another person, I mean, why? Makes no sense, right? <laughs> I only want to go with my own interests. Like, it doesn't serve me well. It even, we, we even talk like this. It does not serve me well. Well, hold on. That's a very short-term perspective. Mm -hmm. That's a bad business if you think about it. Um, Long-term is where does it serve well, you know, the people I serve. And sure, in the short term, I'm not making any money. I'll get a job and I'll be paying for it out of my own paycheck. I've done that. Hope, you know, I hopefully some of you uh, resonate with that. I mean, and only then people catch up and they say, no, I want to go to him. He writes articles in newspapers. <laughs> in the newspapers. Um, he's the friendly voice. I mean, so giving, giving our eyes to another person, Ed, that's, I don't think that's in us. And I think that has to be trained. And I think that has to be maybe contemplated on every day and to kind of maybe turn yourself into somebody like that. So anyway, sorry, guys, I'm speaking a little too much. Dr. Cardino, does, does that story in any way tie in with anything that you've shared today or your core values or your philosophy? Well, I, I uh, agree with what uh, Anton just said about um, de delivering value to others uh, as being a very important priority. Uh, to establish a uh, presence in your uh, in a sphere of influence and with your and within your community. As I said, I, I think it's been uh, my experience that uh, the more you uh, focus on delivering value to others, uh, the better it is for you in the long run. These are um, you know, when I first was, uh, as a, as a surgeon, I was trained to do operations. And, um, as a resident, when you're in training, you do the surgery and you take care of the patient while they're in the hospital and then they leave and you very rarely see them much again. They, they might come to the clinic, but you may or may not be there, but so your whole experience there is more of a transactional one in which you deliver the service, which would be the operation or just the uh, hospital care that you deliver to your uh, patients, and then they're gone and you never see them again. But when you're actually in practice, you really, um, you really need to think more about developing a relationship with the patient because you're going to probably see them for several months, even if they are doing well and uh, you end up discharging them. Uh, but many of our patients uh, you know, have lifelong issues that you have to see them every uh, year or two or three or five years, or they have uh, family members or they have uh, friends that need uh, help. And uh, if you've established a relationship with them, uh, they will, the patients will come to you and they'll say, um, you operated on my husband 15 years ago and he since passed away, but now I have a problem. And I realized, I remembered how much quality care you delivered to him. And here I am, you know, and I think you can help me as well. So again, delivering value to, to uh, people, I think in the long run is going to, uh, really help you. And I think it works in, in really any kind of business, uh, whether you're in retail and, or you're in a, a restaurant business, or you're delivering a service, uh, computer repair, or I don't know, home improvement. Um, the relationships are really critical. So that's why developing communication skills, I think is really, really, uh, helpful. How many of us have had the experience where we've uh, wanted to hire a home repairman or handyman and 
you can't get in touch with them or they say they're going to be there and they never show up or they show up 15 hours late. And, um, you know, those kinds of things, I, th I think, resonate with everybody. So no matter what business you're in, no matter what you do for a living, uh, communication, showing up on time, showing up prepared, I think, are really important. You know, and one thing, one thing, one other thing I wanted to say was uh, uh, that the, the young lady that mentioned uh, writing the ebook. Um, I, I was at a meeting one time, and uh, the guy was trying to promote writing a book, and he said, "You know, you should try to uh, write a book that's specific to your audience or your, you know, service area that you're in." He said, "Because if somebody comes to you and..." they've got a choice between who's going to take care of them or whatever. Are they going to go to you or the guy down the street that wrote the book? When you wrote the book, you're the authority on that subject. So uh, if you, if it's feasible, if it makes sense for your industry, you know, writing a short ebook or something like that, that focuses on one specific problem, it might be a, a really good way to uh, establish your authority. Thank you. You know, that little story, and I don't mean to dwell on it, but there's so many different ways you could look at it. Could we say that maybe the blind girl didn't know her core values and didn't stick by them and allowed circumstances to change her thinking? But, yes, Marsha. Well, I um, w want to take a issue with what Anton said as far as how he viewed the uh, story, because I think that he was being selfish. I think he was serving his own interest because he loved her. He wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. And so he was willing to give up his eyes to be able to be with the woman that he loved. And so maybe that's the romantic in me, but that's how I saw that part of the story. But another thing, just being more literal, when he said, I hope you enjoy seeing life through my eyes, I think that this is something that I've really discovered as far as with, we're talking about our customers or our clients. If, um, if we don't know who they are and what they think, and the only way we can know that is to talk to them. Um, you know, Rick and I had a tremendous experience um, before COVID hit, uh, getting out and talking to hospitals, physical therapists, occupational therapists, child life specialists, who, um, and because we were actually going there to find out um, about their patients and what their patients would need. But what they told us was what they needed. And we found out all this information by asking questions and, um, and being open, just like the doctor said, having listening more than talking and sitting there writing down notes and going, okay, this is what people need. This is what they're really thinking, not what we thought that they needed or what we thought that they were thinking. And so we've got to get out of our own heads. And the only way we can is to reach out to our customers or our potential customers or clients and ask them. Thank you, Marcia. Maurice, are you still there? Maurice Lewis. Well, maybe he ducked away. Maurice always gives us an interesting point of view. Uh, Kelly Knowles, any, any words of wisdom from you? Wisdom, no, but there's a question I've been pondering quite a bit, and I would love to hear from you all. I hear a lot about you need to associate with winners. You need to associate with people at the next level. You need to make sure you're surrounding yourself with success. There's something that's niggling within me on that. And it is, wait a minute, how do we help give that nether, that person behind us who may look at us as a success? How do we help pull them up? You know, just like with an attitude, one of the things that has impacted me is I have a manager at the law firm who is positive and she lives and breathes an optimistic, positive attitude. She's had a great influence on me because I do not wake up with sunshine. 
So I've struggled with this. I've had some tension with this because I keep hearing level up, hang out with people with success, hang out with people. And then there's a part of me that says, hold up. How do we help pull those people that need that even more than we do? I hope that makes sense. I'd love to hear some insights if you think it's relevant. Anyone like to comment? Sure. Absolutely. I think it's awareness. We always want to, those of us that are self-aware, we want to learn more. We want to climb that ladder. We want to go up. We want to hang out with people that are successful, but also be aware that there are people that look up to us. So that's where humility comes in. We never know who's watching. I think somebody mentioned that. And that's, it's so true. So I like to encourage people to ask questions. We don't know what level anyone is on and we can only teach from the level we're at. So while we're clawing our way up that ladder, what are we doing to give back? And I mean, that can come, come around in many different ways in terms of our business. You know, do we give back to the community? Are we actively involved in events? And in our personal life, it's about being aware of friends, family, our peer group, whereabouts are they? How often do we call and check up on these people? A simple phone call, a simple text, these little things that oftentimes it's easy to lose sight of because we are, we're working on climbing that ladder. We want more, we want better, we want to learn. And like Anton says, you know, it's all about this, this me, 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 me stuff. If we could flip it and think, what are we doing for other people? I think that's key to have that balance between climbing that ladder and then also looking back down a couple of rungs and grabbing somebody from a couple of rungs down and bringing them up to where you currently are, if that makes sense. You know, that brings to mind another thought that really a, a leader's job is not only to lead others, to train others, but the epitome is when they create a leader of leaders. You agree? Mm-hmm. Maurice, you always have an interesting point of view, (laughs) which ties right in with, uh, for those that don't know it, uh, Maurice is the executive director of Point of View, one of the oldest public service TV programs in the world. Uh, Maurice, what have you got to say, my friend? Flexibility and feedback are two critical things for the success of any endeavor that involves other people. Uh, Flexibility is really important because your clientele very often are changing because people are moving up, changing neighborhoods, um, and improving their circumstances. Your reputation will go with them, but um, also being flexible to who are my new clients? Who, Who are my new consumers? What am I picking up along along the way and how do I keep them? Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. Liz, what would a university professor have to say about our content today? So I was writing some notes down. Um, I think the importance of understanding platforms and modeling core values. Uh, I love this chat because actually in the introduction assignment I have for students, they have to upload videos And in it, they have to let us know three of their top values. And so for many of them, they've never thought about these things. And so it's kind of just a prompt to start thinking about these things. Uh, Because I see with students so often, they're so concerned about doing versus helping them to stop and understand their why. So I have a little bit of power because I can almost force them into that via assignments but I think the, the goal is to have them start thinking in a way instead of just on the platform, on the conveyor belt that is higher education. Why are you here? What is your goal? What are you doing each and every day to try to prepare for your next step? Because that magical piece of paper doesn't automatically get you a job. And so trying to just help them really think about how are you developing yourself, the intangibles that are going to set you apart when you actually try to enter the real world. So this has been really helpful for me. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Murray, are, are you there, buddy? Well, maybe Aaron stepped away. What about John Shank? John? Hey, Aaron, I see you. Hey, Glenn. Up. Yeah. Hey, hey. yeah. yeah you can let Aaron go first. I'm, I'm here. Oh, you that's fine. You're, you're there. Go right ahead. Yeah, I, I would, I would say, uh, 
as far as modeling your core values, um, you know, I work for a very large corporation, but that, but, but I understand the importance of that. We, we do that big time at at and We talk about, uh, diversity. We talk about, uh, what's important to us. We just made, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, uh day yesterday, a, a, a company holiday, right? And, and, and we all know why we, well, we did that. There's the importance of, of, of showcasing unity in this country right now. So I, I understand that it's something that in my business, when I go out and sell, which is what I do, that I tout those things. I, I tout those core values of at and which are my core values, right? I believe in diversity. I believe in, in uh, you know, promoting women in the workplace and we do all those things. So I think it's very important to do that. So I echo what a lot of you were saying about that. And I totally agree with, uh, with expressing the core values of your company uh, is a hallmark of, of what you do and, and, and an important way to, uh, to, to bring customers to you. Thank you there, John. Uh, Aaron, uh, are you back with us? Yes, I am. Yeah. What are your comments or questions? You know, to go off of what, what John was saying there, you know, it's interesting how simple of a concept it is to have uh, basic values in your business, um, especially starting with the mission statement, right? Uh, the doctor mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, it takes quite a bit of time to write a really good mission statement. Something that uh, identifies the goals you have for your organization or for the people in it or even for your customers. And um, I remember years ago, five, six years ago, writing mission statements for um, some of my early businesses. And there were a few exercises that we did in, in college uh, at UTC. And it's such a simple practice, but when executed well, uh, make a world of difference. And I think that... Uh, we need a little bit more of that. We need a little bit more understanding as to how big of a role values and mission statements play in relation to doing work, doing business, networking. Um, I think we're, we're overlooking that quite a bit these days. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Rick, any comment from you? Yeah, I'm sort of going through my mind here that um, one thing I see you deal with customers or people or whatever it is, everybody has value. And even the people like below that you want to give information to and teach, they also are coming from, sometimes they're younger, so they're coming from a different perspective. So they can also give back to you a new perspective on where the new market might be going. And the same as they're older and they're, they're teaching you stuff, they've also gone through, made a lot of mistakes and keep you from making those same mistakes. So there's, it's not just a, it's always a two-way street with people, always. And I, I've met so many people, I've done so many different things that I know it sounds like there's no way when I start talking about doing something new that I've done that you didn't know I did. But I've always liked it that way. And, uh, I liken it to, to the type of way I do my artwork. I don't have a set style. Most artists do. I have lots of different styles. And uh, I, my favorite art form actually is not one that I do. is dance. If you want to be a professional dancer, you have to know all the different styles. And because that's the only way you're going to get enough work to keep doing what you like doing. So you have to learn things. I, I taught one girl that uh, was a, a friend of mine's dance class. I was doing some artwork of the dancers and she came out of this one uh, workshop that they had saying, well, I didn't like their style. So I didn't want to pay attention to that. And uh, I said, wait, you, you know, she's young. I said, go learn what they're doing. Go back in there and learn what they're doing. You may not like it, but you'll, you need that in your vocabulary to know why you don't like it. And to, as long as you have it, there may be a situation where you, it actually works and you'll have it. And 
if you're teaching and you can explain to them why this style doesn't work, you have that for that purpose. So it's, it's, there's always something you pick up. It's always a two way street. There's always something worth learning from somebody. And I grew up learning that way because a short story about the way I grew up was I was the son of the president of Georgia Tech. And I started living there. I was five years old and I lived there until I was almost 18. And I met everybody from the, the groundskeeping people that we really liked. They're generally the ones they asked to our parties to uh, astronauts, movie stars, governors, presidents. I sat in the football box with B.B. Uh, Rebozo and Richard Nixon one time. So it, it's, you see, one thing you see, especially with, with when I was a kid and I met some of the movie stars like Lauren Green and some of these other people that, see, they're just regular people. You know, the, 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 the iconic business shrinks away and we're all just people walking around on this planet and finding differences and then putting your, uh, your, uh, your, your foundation on that is, uh, that's too easy. You got to find the similarities and there's a lot more similarities than there are differences. And you have to keep an open mind. That's how, that's how you be successful. You got to listen to what other people have to say and you'll, you'll always gain. Can I add my three cents? You sure can. Sounds like a okay. place. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just want to, Sorry, I yeah. just wanted to say a couple things. Well, first of all, uh, one of my next books is going to be called The Golden Waffle. And it's going to be basically talking about being nice to everyone you meet because you never know who you're going to meet. And I'll show you how this story, real quick, how this all came about. I was working in the Burger King drive through and this guy came through my line every Sunday at 530 in the morning. And we would talk. And on the seventh time, he said, I'm going to be mayor of Anchorage because I lived in Alaska is where I'm from. And I said, well, golly gee, Mr. Beckett, you go for it. Well, that guy became the mayor of Anchorage, became a U.S. senator, and there's schools and roads named after him. So I realized way back when that you got to be nice to everyone you meet. Uh, the story, Glenn, you talked about the two people. I think they're both selfish. <laughs> okay. They both have their own self-interest. That's how I look at it now. And um, I was going to leave you with something else. What are you going to say, Glenn? Oh, I wasn't going to say anything. And the, the, the interesting thing about the story is you can carry it in so many different ways. I didn't realize how deep it was when I first discovered it, but uh, you could talk about it forever. I don't didn't mean to take away from what Dr. Cardino was saying, but I, I felt like it kind of tied in with it. Uh, hey, one more thing I wanted to say is that someone told me something very wise before I got going with my own business, and you can apply it to all your businesses as well. Uh, they told me that if you worry about the student, the money will come. So if you're concerned about the people, truly concerned, and help people, then you want to worry about money. That's, that's, that's a good lesson right there. We've, we've got about three minutes left. Greg, Greg Cardino, did you step out on us? Uh, let's see, is Aram in, uh, Aram had, yeah, there you are. Any comment you Um, <clears throat> no, I, I enjoyed the, the presentation. Um, you know, I, I always struggle on, on the business side with uh, what I'm trying to do. So, uh, uh, hopefully I'll, uh, you know, when you put out the recording, I can review the things again and again. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's curious how on your story, you know, people, <laughs> we have at least four different uh, views on, on it. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I thought I had one, but now I'm not so sure <laughs> after listening to everybody else. Thank you, Aram. Uh, Greg, Got anything to say about the wisdom your dad shared with us today? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think there are a lot of good tips in the presentation, but um, one thing that I found was really interesting was the, uh, like, that you shared the story about the girl who posted on Facebook that she's leaving uh, the, the, she doesn't want to work in the office of uh, the, the other doctor anymore 
because she was treated poorly. Um, and that just got me thinking about kind of what Aaron mentioned a few minutes ago about uh, the importance of mission statements. It's something, it's something so simple that when you read it, it might be like a sentence long, but um, the more thought you put into it, the, the, uh, the better it's going to be uh, for everyone. Because I, I think we, we live in a world that uh, the world of social media, where people are pumping out content constantly. And there's, there's like a kind of a call to post something every day. But I think a lot of these things lack uh, depth because there, there's not, there's not enough thought put into them. And so um, I, I think in, in a world that's constantly pumping stuff out, uh, there's a value in, in giving things a bit more thought and p- putting a little bit of more depth into what you're putting out into the world, whether that's your mission statement, what the way you treat people in your business, the way you treat your customers uh, and the people you work with. Um, because f- if I'm going to a surgeon, uh, if I need a surgery, um, maybe there's several, uh, several surgeons who are equally competent in doing the surgery. Uh, of course, I want to go to the one that's, that treats me better. You know, I think anybody would. Uh, and so I think, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, but what I'm saying is I, I, I agree with what Aaron said. And I think, um, it's, it's really important to take time, take a lot of time to think about these things and how you want to, uh, treat people and how you want to, what, what, you, what's your, going to be your mission statement to, that you put out to the world and, and in the, in everything you put out, um, and, and to resist the, the, uh, the constant, um, you know, kind of draw toward put, putting stuff out constantly, but actually take, put, put some thought into, um, the things that you put out into the world. Thank you there, Greg. And, uh, you know, what an example, you know, it's, it's easy to talk the talk, but walk in the walks, what makes a difference. And I think that Dr. Cardino is an excellent example of one that walks the walk. We see the results with a fine son, Greg here. So I think that in itself. Can I uh, add, a, add a, a quick point? One of the things that we didn't talk about with all of the information that's outgoing, uh, evaluating properly the information that's coming back and what is being disseminated. Uh, And when you get something that's out there that's negative, do you have a plan on how you address negative publicity? I think that's very important for us, to, for anyone to have. Uh, our time's running out. It's, it's uh, 931. Uh, for those that might want to stick around a few minutes after I end the recording, I say it's kind of like going up and saying hi to the speaker if we're at a, a live venue. So uh, remember, folks, your day will be just as good as you visualize it. Uh, will our speaker for the next mastermind will be a friend of mine, Ron Cooper, Uh, who is located up in Southern Maryland. He is uh, a coach and has done a lot of work in the area of leadership, and he was a fighter pilot. Uh, So we're going to learn from him from a fighter pilot's perspective. I don't have the exact title of his program. I'll have it uh, real soon and get it posted. So again, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Stick around if you'd like to talk for a few more minutes. 